Well, let me add my good morning to you as well this morning for those, so many of you in house this morning and then also for those that are joining us online. It's, uh, it's great to be back. <laughs> um, we've been back almost, well, two weeks today uh, since we returned from Africa. It is a little bit strange that we have electricity. Um, we were getting used to turning up to churches and being told, oh, there's no electricity, so we're going to delay the service for a couple of hours until we get a generator. So um, it's also strange not to have a translator. So often where we went, we had a translator. So it's great that, uh, well, my children tell me I'm a bit of a bogan, and so probably uh, I do talk like a bit of a bogan at times, so maybe... I do need a translator from time to time, so hopefully you can keep up with me this morning. Uh, but welcome to Mission Sunday. We are really excited um, for what's going to happen in the service today. I'm very mindful that it doesn't turn into an African service, uh, that uh, we're not st still sitting here in three hours' time. Um, so we are pushing through with a lot of different things this morning. We're doing things a little bit different, so you're going to hear from a lot of different people this morning, which I think is wonderful because there are so many people involved in mission. Um, but before I start, I did promise some churches in Uganda that I would pass on their greetings to you. Uh, so from Rock Hill Church in uh, Champezi, uh, from Ransom Pentecostal Ministries in Kalaji, um, and from New Hope Ministries in Legali, which is in Batumbula district, uh, their pastors were very adamant and made me promise that I would pass on their greetings to you. Uh, they were very adamant, all of them, that they wanted to, that you to know that they are praying for our church here, uh, that they are so thankful um, to know that a church in Australia, the, the body of Christ in Australia, has not forgotten them and um, is supporting them um, through sending a team, but also uh, th through prayer as well. Uh, New Hope Ministries uh, is a brand new church. It was planted last year. Uh, we got to spend some time there. Alia, while she was there for a long time, uh, was sort of part of that church planting. Uh, where they are in uh, Batumbla, uh, so the village they're, they're in Lugali, um, the guys there tell us that their community is 85, 90% Muslim and there hadn't been a Christian church there in over 70 years. So they, it, it's, there's now 50 Christians in that church that are regularly attending services on a Friday and on a Sunday. And while we were there, we spent a week uh, with the, the team then with uh, Kuza Children's Foundation and the the leaders of the church there, and we had an opportunity on one morning to speak to the leaders of the church. And I love the fact that when they talk about the leaders of their church, it's everyone from the senior pastor right through to the ushers. That They have this attitude that everybody is a leader in the church, that they all take responsibility what was happening with the church. And so they wanted us to give the, well, wanted me to give them some direction about what they should do as leaders in their church? What should they do? What's some important things that they should focus on while they start this new church in this community? And, and I suppose one thing that I spoke to them about was this need that in the Bible, there's lots of things that are unclear. There, there are a lot of things that are open to interpretation and we can have differences of opinion. And that's great. But the Bible is very clear about some things, very clear. And so as leaders, I encourage them to make sure they held on to those essentials, uh, that as leaders that they didn't get confused with the important things and made them essential things. And so the essential things like prayer and essential things like baptism. And I suppose one of those things that we wanted to touch on today was the, the essential thing of, of mission. The Bible is very clear about mission. So I wanted to start with looking at uh, just some verses in Matthew chapter 28 and, and reading from verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, 
to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is one of the last things that Jesus did with his disciples, and he is very clear, very clear as he commissions them about going out. Now, Jesus started with the disciples, but we are all called to the mission that God has given his people. Because everyone who responds to the call to follow Jesus becomes an heir of the command to make disciples of all nations. As followers of Christ, our mission is to be disciples who make disciples. The church is a way for followers of Jesus to act together as one body with Jesus as the head to fulfill this mission. And because the Bible's really clear about this, that's why as a church, as, as Humeridge, we have been deliberate in always supporting mission. As a congregation, we, we support a number of different missions, both locally here in Toowoomba, in Australia, but also internationally across the globe. And, and I would love to have been able to give you an update on all of them this morning, but we wanted just to focus on a few, uh, not because they're any more important or anything like that, but we wanted to make sure we did it well, that we looked at these missions and were able to give an adequate update. So we're going to look just at a handful this morning. The first one we're going to look at um, is with Mission Aviation Fellowship. Now, we've, as a church, for a long time had supported MAF um, and then... Um, some things had changed, but last year we renewed that support with MAF. Uh, the purpose of MAF uh, is to deliver practical and spiritual care to people in places of the deepest human need all over the planet. And so by using aircraft, MAF bring in the essentials of life, as well as medical care, emergency things. And I think probably the most important thing, Christian hope. So we're going to watch a short video in a second from MAF, um, and then Haley's going to come and tell us a little bit of what MAF is doing in the lead up to Father's Day. Oh, yes, I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it takes. It takes to be a MAF man. Let's try. That's what it takes to be a MAF Yes, that's, I, think, I think that's good. It's, <laughs> it's, that could come together, but who would ever record it? <sighs> Thanks.
No one will ever record that song, will they? I mean, um, wait. Hey, have you, were, you guys been here all along? Well, who are you guys? Uh, they're from MAF. Oh, you're MAF guys. Well, it's lucky you're here because uh, I was going to mention, I noticed in the front of the magazine that it's uh, coming up. It's Father's Day and, and you can do the fuel for Father's Day. And if you do that, you can make your dad a math man, cause that's what it takes to be a math man. All right, out. Good morning, everyone. So what's this Fuel for Father's Day project? So this humble little jerry can holds one of the most precious resources, and that's fuel. With every five minutes, an MAF plane is taking off to remote places around the world, and so they need your help. So when one jerry can gets poured into the aircraft of an MAF plane, they are fueled for 20 minutes of flying. So when reaching isolated communities, this saves and replaces days of travel on foot, helping to get to more people and hopefully saving more lives. And by purchasing this, purchasing this gift of fuel for Father's Day, not only are you giving a free fuel on behalf of your dad, making him a math man, but you're also supporting this life-saving ministry. So if you happen to have a dad that is hard to buy for, here's the perfect gift for your dad on Father's Day. They will be available on the 21st and the 28th of August. Now, I want to introduce our special guest, Helen McGrath, who is a manager of the housing hub Toowoomba, I know you've heard a lot about the winter shelter from us, but today we have thought that it would be good to hear from someone else about the impact that the winter shelter is having. So please, let's welcome Helen. Thank you, Hayley. Good morning, everybody. Let's put my pages back together. So my name is Helen McGrath, I'm the manager of the Toowoomba Housing Hub. The Toowoomba Housing Hub was first established in 2018 as a partnership between Queensland Government and community organisations delivering housing and homelessness services. It is a collaboration of staff from a range of different organisations working together under one roof, dedicated to exploring options for people to help improve their circumstances. So for people who need assistance to address homelessness or housing stress, they can come to one place, the hub, for advice and assistance. Everyone should have a safe place to call home. But our current housing crisis reality means individuals and entire families are living out of tents, in their cars, couch surfing or sleeping rough. Homelessness can strike anyone, anytime. Most of us have the capacity to live within our means, but too many people live without any extra capacity in the event a life curveball strikes and changes our finely balanced lives. Homelessness is a complex social problem with a variety of underlying economic and social factors. These might include the escalating shortage of affordable and available rental housing, such as we're experiencing now, pressure on mortgage commitments, domestic and family violence, unanticipated financial crises, long-term unemployment leading to sustained economic and social exclusion, severe and persistent mental illness and psychological distress, exiting state care without support, 
exiting prison without support, severe overcrowding leading to relationship breakdowns, and lack of supportive relationships and people who can or will assist when life becomes challenging. It is important to understand that people do not choose to become homeless. Life events intervene, often rapidly, and the cumulative impact causes people to become homeless. It is a common theme that people experiencing homelessness feel as though they become invisible and worthless within their communities, without a sense of belonging. Now more than ever, governments and communities are called upon to overcome our indifference to the increasing tragedy of homelessness by actively engaging in addressing the causes and consequences. Overcoming indifference asks each of us to consider how we can be good Samaritans by reaching out with compassion to our vulnerable community members, by expressing our genuine concern for the health and well-being of those who are unable to experience the irreplaceable value of safe housing, as is everyone's basic human right. Most of all, people experiencing homelessness respond best to compassion. To be compassionate, it's important to understand that we are not our circumstances. We are all people first. People who have lived lives, who have loved ones, have aspirations and dreams, and who want to contribute in our own unique and individual ways to our community and our world. Your involvement through Hume Ridge Church in Winter Shelter Toowoomba is an outstanding example of the collective impact of compassion, which is truly delivering a powerful ripple effect. As a collaboration of seven churches partnering with the Toowoomba Housing Hub and under the auspice of Lifeline Darling Downs, through three months of bitter weather, providing safety, warmth, a hot shower, place to do laundry, home cooked meals, good humour and most importantly your companionship, the ripple effect of this service is immeasurable. Your tiniest acts of love, kindness and compassion does have a massive ripple effect. Through your weekly commitment, you restore dignity and hope for distressed people who are reminded through your acts of kindness that there is care, friendship and help when most needed. Through your kindness, we see guests transforming from being closed off and holding their life stories close to their chest to talking freely about their struggles and hopes for their future. This helps both guests and hub staff keep focus on their most appropriate housing options. More than that though, it gives everybody hope. We at the Hub see the cumulative benefit of winter shelter. You have made the world a better place for the people who cross your path, even if it's not obvious to you. Let me share with you a quote from a guest who's experienced winter shelter. Winter shelter is something that should have been around a lot longer than it has. Not only did it offer somewhere to lay my head of a night, the opportunity to enjoy a hearty meal and the necessity of a hot shower, it showed me kindness and compassion. It's helped me restore happiness and the little faith I had left from living rough on the cruel streets. It opened up a whole new world to me. Struggling to maintain normality in my life, volunteers showed me not everyone looked at me like a street bum, replacing a frown with a smile and a park bench with a bed. For these volunteers, enough can't be said. The streets are mean and can be cruel and violent and a truly dark place. But thanks to all involved, because you are truly amazing. You save lives like angels sent from the heavens above. You helped me and stopped me from giving up. I don't know how I'm ever going to thank you, but I would like you all to know that this is one person that felt the love you showed and showing me not everything in this world is cruel and mean. So I ask you, remember the ripple effect of what you do. Every interaction you make unintentionally causes an impact and you can choose whether that is positive or negative. As part of Winter Shelter, 
we see you using intentionally the ripple effect of compassion, which changes people's lives experiencing homelessness. Give yourself a moment of joy to acknowledge you have truly been a collective force of benevolence, caring about helping people live their best lives, whatever their circumstances. Remember, do not judge about homelessness. It could be you or me tomorrow, and we would want people to care. When you go to sleep tonight with your head on a soft pillow in a warm house that you can call home, either through renting, home ownership, or living safely with family and friends, please ask for God's blessing that those people who, through their burden of homelessness, do not enjoy that same comfort and security will at least be safe. In closing, to all involved, it's because of your hard work that our seed of an idea planted way back in 2019 for vulnerable people to have a safe and warm place to stay during winter has now come true and we have seen lives changed. We owe this success to everybody's combined efforts, your contagious generosity and your quiet determination to keep the winter shelter doors open, however uncomfortable or inconvenient. Helen Keller once said, life is an exciting business and most exciting when lived for others. Thank you for listening, thank you for caring, and thank you for sharing God's spirit through Hume Ridge Winter Shelter. Okay, good morning church. Um, my name's Emma and um, I'm just up here this morning to share about um, a cause that uh, Hume Ridge has been supporting for about five years now, the Kakuma orphans um, from South Sudan. So um, there'll be some photos come up. Uh, so my husband Ben and I were in Uganda the first week of July, so a couple of weeks ago, and um, we got to meet them, which was really amazing. So there's a group of children that um, were orphans and were in Kakuma refugee camp, which is a large, large refugee camp in the north of Kenya, um, and it um, houses a lot of the refugees from many countries, but mainly South Sudan, from their um, wars and their um, trouble that they're having there. Um, and with our, with our partnership with um, Bishop Daniel Abbott and the Anglican Church over there, um, we were able to sponsor and support um, some of those children being taken from the refugee camp as orphans and placed in boarding school in Uganda um, and um, homed with like foster families during holidays and cared for. Um, so that was when they were a lot younger uh, and we got to meet them now five years on and they're all um, teenagers now, 14, 15, 16, um, and yeah, just being able to meet with them and speak with them now in English, they're all just so grateful, um, and they could speak to us about how before in the camp um, everything was darkness and they couldn't um, have any thoughts of the future because it was just day by day, and now they're at boarding school and um, they just have the, all this hope for what they're going to do, and they were so just yeah, overwhelmingly grateful that this church in Australia has never met them and we're not their family, but we would care for them and we would choose them um, and help them to get an education and a safe place to stay. So they were just so grateful. So I want to pass that on to you guys and update you. Um, and they're all doing really well um, at school and catching up all the grades um, that they'd missed. Um, so lots of them are only just finishing kind of grade seven, even though they're a lot older because you've got to start from the start. Um, but then also we got to meet um, one little girl whose name's Angia, um, and she's five years old. She has just recently come to stay with those orphans and the ladies looking after them in Uganda. Um, she only came last year. She was found um, when authorities came to a village that had been um, attacked by rebels and massacred, so over 65 people were killed and um, there was thought that there was no survivors, but um, this one little girl was lying beside her mother who had also been killed, um, but began moving, so they um, quick, the authorities took her um, and through the church 
um, the Anglican church over there, they took her to hospital and um, she'd been shot and she has a lot of um, scars and stuff now, but she um, has been released from hospital and she's staying with these guys. Her name's Angia. Um, she's five now. She's the sweetest little girl. Um, and I just wanted to be able to show you her photo um, and her story um, because it's very easy over there to be forgotten and not to have anyone care for you. And there's lots of kids with these stories, but um, I think as a church, the fact that we can support them, even from so far away, and even though uh, many of us won't get to meet them, um, they um, are just so thankful and they can't believe that um, yeah, people that don't know them would, would care about them. One little, one of the girls said, I know that God is real because, you know, your church sent you and um, your church has, you know, chosen me. And, oh, that just got me. But I just wanted to show you this little girl. And we hope that um, with the generosity of this church that um, we might be able to support her as she'll start school next year. She'll be six, so she'll start grade one. So we're hoping that we can um, be able to support her as well as the other kids. So that's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Good morning, church. Um, it's awesome to see you all here this morning. And as Jason said, it's really great uh, for all of us to be back here um, worshipping with you all. Um, so this morning, I wanted to give you a bit of an overview um, of what the trip was like for the team. Um, but I guess I firstly really wanted to thank all of you um, for your prayers and for what each of you gave to make our trip possible. Um, because you didn't just touch the lives of the people over in Uganda, uh, but you significantly touched and changed the lives of each of us that went um, in such amazing ways. Um, and Jason has said this before, um, but as amazing it was as it was for us to go over to Uganda, uh, what each of you contributed for us uh, to be able to go there and to do what we did uh, mattered just as much um, as us being over there. Um, so from the bottom of our hearts, I just wanted to say thank you from the whole team uh, because, yeah, you really did change our lives and um, you made a huge impact on the people over there. Um, so I don't have a lot of time to tell you heaps about the trip, but I just wanted to give you an idea um, of what we experienced and what it was like. Uh, so... I really also want to encourage you um, after the service to please come and talk to um, any of us um, about the stories that we have and the things that we experienced uh, because we'd love nothing more than to share um, what we went through with you um, and the impact that you guys had and your prayers had on us but also on the people of Uganda. Um, so <clears throat> I want to give you some brief highlights um, from what we experienced, uh, one of which was uh, me being the only one of the team that uh, adopted a Ugandan name, uh, which was Mateo. Um, so I was pretty proud of that. So I started calling myself that and introducing myself as that to everyone. Um, and as we know, Jason likes to... Uh, sometimes make fun of people. Um, so he thought it was a great idea that everywhere we went, especially in Batumbla, he thought it was a great idea to encourage everyone to help me find a wife. <laughs> so I became quite famous as Matteo, um, looking for a wife to the point where I was genuinely offered uh, to marry somebody's daughter. So <laughs> that was awesome. Um, <laughs> but um, now, in all seriousness, um, we got to baptize um, 56 people, which was incredible. Um, we got to experience a prayer and praise night um, in the bush in the middle of nowhere um, in the pitch dark um, around a fire, uh, which was pretty incredible. Um, we got to do speeches, uh, devotions, uh, and mini sermons that I don't think any of us expected or anticipated to give. Um, we got to visit people in their homes um, that broke our hearts in you know the best kind of ways, 
And we got to meet people um, that changed our lives and with whom we had uh, unexplainable connections with, uh, which was really special. Um, and so the theme of the trip repeatedly uh, seemed to be God placing us in situations that I think we all felt very ill-equipped for, uh, that we often didn't feel good enough. Uh, we were scared or nervous. Um, sometimes we'd question, you know, what, what the heck are we doing here? Why are we doing this? Um, why did God pick us to do this? Like, we can't, we can't do this. Um, but I think after the first few days and the first few experiences of some of the things that we did, um, we quickly learned that when God places you in a situation um, like that, um, he, he doesn't leave you alone in them. Um, and especially when you choose to step into that situation, uh, God shows up and his spirit works, his spirit comes, comes alive in you. Um, and with the help of God, um, we were able to do some incredible things that um, yeah, we honestly didn't think we'd ever do. Um, so I thought I'd leave you with one story that'll give you an idea of um, what that was like. Um, so in the second week um, in Batumbla, when we were working with the Kuza team, uh, we had already spoken at multiple events, um, which you know none of us expected to do, um, and those are stories in themselves. Um, but prior to going to Uganda, we knew that in Batumbla we'd be speaking to a school. Um, and when Jason first told us this, uh, he didn't really know how many kids we'd be speaking to or what we would be speaking about. So we had a rough idea that it might be, you know, 50 to 100 kids maybe. Um, and so we were all like, you know, pretty freaked out about that, you know, speaking to um, kids in a completely different country and we didn't know what we'd speak, be speaking about. Um, a few weeks later, Jason then enlightened us um, by telling us that this had now gone to 300 kids. Um, so we were like, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so then we got over there, we got to Batumbla, um, and we, you know, we were, um, like I said, we had spoken at previous events, so we, we were getting a small taste of it. Those were sort of 50 to 100 people. We knew we had this school coming up. Um, and so... The day before we went to this school, the Kuza team told us that um, now this was, had become 500 kids. Um, and it was also an Islamic school. So there were lots of factors as to why I think all of us were feeling very nervous. Um, and the point of us going to this school was to t talk about uh, teenage pregnancies uh, because that's a, quite a significant issue in Uganda. Um, so I think all of us had the idea that um, perhaps one of us would be speaking with Jason. Um, so I think we were all trying to hopefully get out of that um, and dob somebody else in, um, namely Haley, because we like to pick on her. <laughs> um, so the Kuza team started uh, telling us the night before who would be speaking and what we would be speaking about. Um, so first off, they picked Kelsey and Haley um, to speak about the menstrual cycle and women's hygiene, um, which was really awesome. So I was like, sweet, not me. Um, then they turned to Margaret and Dylan and they were like, you know, you guys are gonna speak on uh, the development um, from childhood to adulthood and what kids go through uh, physically and mentally. And so at this stage I was like, sweet, everyone's paired off. You know, I'm not gonna have to speak, this is awesome. Um, and so I was sitting in a corner, you know, just loving life. And then the girls got this look on their faces and looked at me. And I just knew that they were going to dob me in, which they did. Um, it was a targeted attack. Um, so they pointed at me and was like, you know, what about Matt? What about Matt? Um, he's got to speak too. So um, Eddie, um, one of the guys from the Kuza team, was like, oh, yeah, Matt. Yeah, you can speak on... Um, what a good man is and how to respect women. So I was like, awesome, easy, right? Um, so we had a night to prepare what we'd be speaking about um, to these, what we thought would be 500 kids. 
Um, and so hopefully some photos will show up. Um, so the next day we rocked up to this school um, and just before we went to speak, we found out that it was now 1,200 kids. <laughs> Um, so that was a bit of a faith testing moment for us all because we, could, we couldn't pull out of what we were about to do. Um, and so as is custom when you go to like a church or a school in Uganda, they tend to sit you up the front on chairs facing the congregation like this, uh, which is a bit nerve wracking um, uh, with all these see your faces that you were looking at. Um, but I think in that moment for all of us, we, I think all were silently thinking that we knew that God was in this with us, that he had gotten us this far. Um, and if we had done all the stuff that we had done prior to this, that this is something that we could do as well, even if it's something that, you know, we never imagined ourselves doing. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, that was an amazing experience, uh, being able to talk to all those kids. And the team did such a beautiful job um, about you know, what each of us was speaking about. And as you'll see, um, afterwards we got to uh, go down and meet some of the kids. Um, and that was, you know, a beautiful moment in itself. And there's lots of beautiful stories in that as well. Um, but yeah, that, that was a, an incredible day for all of us. And I think one that we looked back on uh, throughout the trip, um, just kind of being like, wow, I can't, you know, we can't believe that we did that. Um, we can't believe we did something like that. Um, but that was, you know, that was, the, that's, that was the glory of God. That was God working through us and, and he made that happen and he made that work. Um, and it was awesome. Um, and so, you know, something like that and like there are so many other stories that we, where, you know, God put us in situations and, and got us through stuff that, you know, seemed insane and didn't make sense. Uh, but that's our God, right? That's what he does best. Um, that's how he works. Um, so I just want to thank you guys, uh, our church family, for making that possible um, and for being with us in that, in your prayers. Um, because, yeah, we, we, we have so many amazing things that we experienced like that. And like I said, we would really love uh, to share them with you. So please, uh, please come and talk with us. Um, please let us share these stories with you because uh, they really changed our lives and, and they really changed the lives of, of those people. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of an overview of our trip. Um, so, yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, Matteo. Um, I suppose it wouldn't be right of me if I just, um, I didn't make the same offer that I made in Uganda. So if any of you have got someone that would be an appropriate wife for Matt, uh, please come and see me. It would be great. Um, I should also make mention of it's great that Matt talked about that he was getting out of speaking and then got dobbed in. Uh, Dylan was actually supposed to speak this morning, but he decided to get COVID yesterday. Uh, so uh, it was great. Another targeted attack and Matt was here this morning. I just want to make two points uh, on some of the things that we've touched on this morning. And it's I just need to say thanks for everyone that's shared this morning, uh, especially to Helen. Um, she was having a little bit of a freak out when I did ask her to come, uh, but you did great, Helen, so thank you. Uh, the first thing I want to touch on this morning, that mission isn't easy, that stepping into mission, it's stepping into that command of Jesus of going to make disciples, it's daunting. Uh, it's, it's uncomfortable, it's messy, quite often it's really overwhelming. And I think Matt touched on a little bit of that, of some of the stuff that we did um, was not easy. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised that mission isn't easy. Because when we look at the life of Jesus, his life wasn't easy, his mission wasn't easy. He left his place of power. He was, he was the prince of heaven, but he chose to step into our world. He chose to give up all the stuff that he knew and come and be with us, to be a man, to suffer the stuff that we go through in the mission of making disciples. This morning, I, I really want to honour the team. 
I really want you to know how fantastic this team of young adults were in Uganda. Um, they, they, people have asked me what was my highlight. And I've said, this team were my highlight. They, they stepped into situations that weren't easy. Um, for those of you that have followed us on social media, you've seen some of the photos and you've probably seen a photo of this little girl, Surprise. Surprise is seven. Uh, she's at the Rehabilitation Centre at, uh, at Champezi. Um, she has one arm because a uh, witch doctor had removed both her legs and her other arm to use in rituals. And I know for me, when I first saw Surprise, and she just, she was sitting there just with this great grin on her face, that's a little bit daunting. Of how, what do I do with this? How do I pick up this kid? How do, I, how do I relate this kid that's had this trauma in her life? And I think that's a great photo of Kelsey holding Surprise, because despite how confronting that was. The team from here just stepped into those situations. Um, so it's, it's not easy. It's not easy when you see little kids with bellies swollen from malnutrition or you're spending time with them and they're just dressed in rags. And that's not easy. That's not easy to take. That, it's really tough that any kid lives like that. And yet, the team, these young adults, they chose to look after these kids. They stepped into their situations. They, they were carrying them around. We, we would wander somewhere and I would see Dylan and Matt walk along holding hands with little kids that wanted to walk with them. And the best thing was just the laughter and the smile. That the smiles on these kids' faces of once they got... Once they got over the whole deal of, ooh, white people, and, well, they're a bit scary, they just loved, they just loved the team. And for all the stuff that was happening in their lives, for a moment, I think they forgot about what was happening because these young adults were there and they were caring about them. Uh, Matt talked about that we got to speak at these Islamic schools. These guys aren't proficient speakers. They don't do it a lot. Uh, they don't, especially the topic that they got to speak about, about puberty and all those things that come with that. That wasn't an easy thing. And they found out the night before that that's what they were going to talk about. So even on, on the bus on the way to going to these schools, they were still writing what they were going to say. And the thing that I love team did a great job. Um, the people, the, the students there loved the team. And that night I spoke to the team and I said it made, the stuff that happened as a result of that makes no sense. That some strangers come into their school, white strangers come into their school. Um, I include Margaret in that. Um, that these people from Australia came to talk to them about a really sensitive topic, something that was uncomfortable um, for them to listen to. Uh, there's no sex education in Uganda. Uh, parents don't talk to kids about it. They just find their way through. So to have these strangers come and talk to them about such an uncomfortable thing, and at the end, young girls would come up and grab, they grab our team and say, I need you to help me with this. Some of the stuff that you've just talked to me about today, I need to talk to you about something in my life. And that makes no sense. It makes no sense that they would do that, to grab a stranger to talk about something so personal that they, they couldn't even talk to their parents about. And yet, they grabbed our team. And just, just amazing. And that is... Matt touched on that as well. That, that's the power of God. That's the power of God working through these young adults. 
Uh, Matt also mentioned that we had the, the privilege of baptising 56 people, and as, as always with African things, um, things never go to plan as the way they were. So in, the initial plan was that we'd hired a, an inflatable pool, we had clean water coming to fill the pool up, everything was great, and so because of the size of the pool, Dylan and I were going to be the ones that were going to baptise these people. And it was supposed to be 9 o'clock in the morning. 11 o'clock came and the water truck hadn't turned up. So, and there was a crowd of people waiting to be baptised. So Eddie and uh, Uncle Steve went out and found a new place to be baptised. Just happened to be a water hole on the side of a swamp. Um, and thankfully, uh, the team just went with it. They just went with it. Uh, we, I walked into the water and just sort of pushed some of the scummy stuff to the side and got to a point where we could get deep enough. And again, the team just were in it, absolutely in it. And what had turned out that it was just gonna be me and Dylan because there were so many people and it was taking so long that at one stage, the whole team were in the water. The whole team were in there baptising these people from, from children through to, to grandmothers and was just a really holy moment. I said to the, the, the church and everyone there that that was a holy moment. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. In Uganda, there's no ocean, so nobody knows how to swim. And uh, so some of the older ladies, when they would come into the water... It was cold, um, and <gasps> take your breath away. But I realised after a couple, of, they weren't going because <gasps> it was taking their breath away. They were going because <gasps> they thought they were going to drown. Um, so to get them up to their waist, and so we ended up baptising in pairs. So Dylan and I, uh, at one point, the first lady we went to baptise, um, we got her down, and then she <laughs> stiffened up, and we couldn't get her under the water. Um, so. Um, it was just that it was funny of trying to get these ladies under the water. The other extreme we had were these ladies that just wanted to get it done so quick. So as soon as we'd take the confession of faith, they, they'd throw themselves back just to get in and out um, so that they didn't drown. But I have to commend the team from here. They have just been, they were just amazing. I suppose the other thing about mission not being easy, Helen talked about winter shelter. A number of volunteers um, that have helped us with winter shelter, that have, have cooked meals, that have been to come and sit with guests, had, some of them have talked to me and said, oh, I don't know how I'm going to go. I've never spoken to someone that's homeless. I've never, I've never done that. Oh, I'm a little bit scared. And I said, just turn up, it'll be fine. And so those pe people have turned up, have stepped into that opportunity of just caring for somebody who has just a different situation in life. And they've made a big difference. You have made a big difference. The common thing that I heard from the team, that I've heard from people in Winter Shelter, is this whole deal of, I was a little bit scared. I, I, I didn't know what to do. There, here's this opportunity and it's hard. But when they stepped into it, when they made that choice to be, be obedient, to follow that command of Jesus and to step into a situation, something happens. God does something. The Holy Spirit does something to us when we're in that situation that at the end we go, oh, that wasn't so bad. Oh, I could do that again. And it doesn't change, it doesn't diminish the, the enormity of probably what that was that we were thinking about doing, but God changes something in us when we decide to step into situations, when we decide to take that step of faith. We talk about faith. We take that risk. Uh, mission work is risky, 
But when we step into it, when we step into that situation and we choose not to step away, God's spirit does something. It changes the people that we're, we're serving and equally it changes us. The second thing that I wanted to touch on this morning about mission, and there's lots of things I could have touched on, but I suppose the second thing that I wanted to touch on was mission isn't meant to be done alone. When Jesus, in, when we, what we read in Matthew, when Jesus called his disciples together, he got them together and he told them as a group. He didn't, he didn't get each one side by, you know, one at a time say, Matthew, come here, I need to tell you this. And then John, come here, I need to tell you this. And he didn't go one by one through all the disciples. He told them together. And I think there was two parts, two reasons why he did that. First one was he wanted all of them to be involved in mission. He wanted all of them to go out and make disciples. But I think the second part of it was his intention was that they do it together, that they were in this together, that he, when he told them together, they knew uh, the expectation uh, that they would have for each other, that they would understand that, okay, God, uh, Jesus has sent us out to this, we need to do this and look after each other in this. And so I think that is the same for us, that when... When God calls us to mission, we do it together. We do it, we do it as a body. Matt, Matt expressed his thanks. Our team were very aware that we were not alone and not doing things by ourselves. Yeah, there was times we were freaking out about what we were going to do, how we were going to do something. But there was things that happened that we knew that we weren't in it by ourselves. The Sunday before we left, I said that while the six of us were going to Uganda the next day, we weren't just the team. The six of us just weren't the team. You were the team. You were part of the team that went with us. And for the three weeks we were away, we were very much aware of your involvement and your contribution with us. Um, in Batumbala, the first day, we got to speak to teenage mums and it was going to be, uh, we expected about 50 uh, teenage mums just to come and, again, I dropped Hayley in it and just went, Hayley, you can take, talk to all these teenage mums about the hope of God, the hope that God has for these young ladies, even though they're mums, that life still has a really good, um, it, it will still be really good for them. And so, of course... More than 100 mums turned up and we had prepared. We had um, 60 buckets of some sugar and some flour to give to the mums. And we went, well, what are we going to do? Thankfully, we had taken um, granny rugs and beanies and jumpers that had been knitted by the women of here for the craft group that had made hygiene kits and they'd also knitted things for babies. We were able to hand them out. And I love this photo. I look, look at that, those faces on those little boys that had got their jumpers and their beanies. And that joy, that joy wasn't because of us, the team. A lot of that joy came because of the ladies that knitted those things. Uh, we were lucky. We, we had the easy part. We had the great job of just handing this stuff out, of being able to hand this stuff out to mums um, to give to their kids or to be able to place a beanie on a baby's head and to see the joy and thankfulness in a mum's face was just amazing. But you made that happen. You made that happen. For the ladies that had spent hours making all those things, not one of those things went to waste. Time and again, we just had hugs and, and cheering and dancing because we'd given children a blanket or a jumper. We got to deliver Bibles to different people and we went to people's houses. And the, when we went there, quite often we'd go into somebody's house and uh, they would, we would ask them, how long since you've had a Bible? Have you ever had a Bible? And one lady said, I haven't had a Bible for three years. I haven't had a Bible for three years. And I would love it. I would love it. 
I look forward to the day and love the day that when Jesus and God decides that I can have a new Bible. And so, um, and she said, oh, the last Bible I had three years ago, it was missing most of the pages anyway, so I only had bits and pieces. And so we were able to deliver Bibles to that lady. And when we handed her a Bible, when we gave her just a basic Bible, she fell to her knees. And you probably saw that photo of this lady just on her knees with her Bible. And we got to deliver Bibles. Now, we didn't buy those Bibles. You bought those Bibles. For those that supported and gave money to give people Bibles, you made that happen. Again, we had the joy of the faces and the hugs of people just so happy to receive Bibles. We went to a church and we, they had invited pastors from other churches and uh, there's a photo of, of the pastor and, and the elder where we'd given them Bibles. We gave them a box of 40 Bibles and we gave them children's Bibles and those faces of joy from receiving a Bible again happened because of what you did the support that you gave made that possible. Uh, in, in the weeks leading up to us going, uh, uh, the Cousa team made us aware and they um, had a little girl by the name of Joyce. Uh, Joyce is six. Um, she's about this big uh, because of whatever... Uh, medical condition she has. This little girl, she can't, she can't stand, she can't move. She's just this little ball. Um, but she speaks with her eyes and she speaks by squeezing your finger and, and she communicates that way. Um, she is one of six kids, second youngest. Mum has, has another little baby um, Dad decided he wasn't going to be around anymore, so he left. So um, mum is by herself and um, was looking after these six kids and it was becoming really difficult because she was trying to carry this newborn and carry Joyce around at the same time. Uh, so Kuzza had put out an appeal to say, look, if, if anyone could help, we'd really love to be able to get Joyce a wheelchair. Uh, we put that communication out to you guys and within a day, we are able to buy that little girl a wheelchair because of families here that are given for this little girl. And so we got to see her, this little girl sitting in a wheelchair, proudly being pushed around by her mum and her older siblings. And I spoke to the Cousa team and I said, look, because of the generosity of the people of Humeridge, we actually have enough money um, if you need any other thing for this family. And they are super poor. And so we visited them and uh, they told us they really need a bed. Mum and their six kids sleep on a dirty piece of foam together, all seven of them on a little bit of foam. So we bought them a bed. Well, you bought them a bed. Um, we... We're able to buy the mattresses and a bunk bed for this family to sleep on, um, which was fantastic. We didn't consider how we're getting it into the house. Um, so I did have a, I wish I had a better photo, um, had gotten a photo. I sat out the front and talked to Joyce because that's, you know, being old, I need to do that. So I just sat and talked with Joyce and I looked in through the doorway and Dylan is on the top of up in the rafters as the team are handing the bunk bed up to go up through the roof space to get it into the bedroom for this family to sleep um, on the bed. But that lady, that lady's smile just says so much. And again, because of what you did here. And the last thing I want to talk about is a toilet. Great thing to talk about in church. Uh, again, before we left, um, the team had, they had um, became aware of a family that uh, the, the toilet, the hygiene of their toilet was pretty bad and um, all it was was, um, yeah, it was a pretty bad way. So they had really big concerns about the safety of the kids of falling in or um, concerns about 
the hygiene because of flies and everything. So uh, they said, Can you, we'd, we'd love to build this family a new toilet. So I went, cool, here's the money, start building a toilet. So Humeridge built a toilet. Uh, and so we would visit when we were there, we'd go and visit the family every day. Mum was a Christian, she was coming to church. Dad was Muslim, had grown up as a Muslim, um, but he was happy for mum to be involved in the church. So on the last day, we had a, an official ribbon cutting ceremony to hand this toilet over to the family. And so we, we did that, we took photos, we got together in a group and prayed a blessing on this family and uh, for just, not for just a toilet, but they would know God's provision and um, that they would come to know him better. At the end of the, the prayer, Ishma, um, the dad, uh, the husband of the wife, um, said to us um, that he, would, he wanted to become a Christian. This man that had grown up a Muslim his whole life because of a toilet is now a Christian. Um, and I know there was lots of other work done by the church and uh, his wife praying for him and the other people of the church at um, New Hope Ministries praying for this man. But I love the fact that the last thing, that last thing that got him there was a toilet. But God used the toilet as his final step to reach in this man and a toilet that you contributed, that you made possible. When God calls us to mission, his, his intention is that his church, that we are all in it together. So thank you so much. I let my add my gratitude to you for your giving, uh, your support and your prayers for while we were away. We saw some immensely, um, just some amazing things happen because of you because of your support and your sacrifice and your generosity, um, some big things happened. Last week, Jen talked about the importance of unity in the church. And I think that when we get this whole deal about unity right, and we get this whole deal about mission right, and we, and we put it together and we combine those things, that we're unified in mission and I, I think we start to get a taste of the glory that we read about in Revelation 7. And this is what it says in Revelation. After this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This amazing vision of the church in Revelation sees people from all different cultural backgrounds come together as one through Jesus. But realising that vision requires us to engage in mission that reaches beyond the boundaries of this, mission, of this building. I used to think that only extraordinary people would do the work of God's mission. I think our team, the Uganda team, probably thought that as well. But we've learned that God uses obedient people, just ordinary people. And through them, his, his power does the extraordinary work of mission. So this morning, I want to encourage you to pursue this call of mission that God has placed on your heart. He's placed on your life. As I said, Jesus called all of us to follow him, to, to go and make disciples of all nations. So I want to encourage you this morning, be bold. Be bold and obediently step into the opportunities that God is giving you to partner with him in the amazing work of making disciples. It's daunting, it's not easy, it's hard. But the Holy Spirit goes with you. The church goes with you. But you don't do this yourself. 
So after the, after the service this morning, we want, to give you, we want you to talk, to ask questions, to have the opportunity to hear some more stories. So Helen is, we've set a table up in the foyer. If you want to hear more about Wintershelf, if you want to hear about homelessness, more of that stuff, um, go and have a chat to Helen. Have a chat to Helen about um, what she is seeing as a result of the churches. Um, and have a chat to Helen about um, this whole deal with the housing crisis and potentially how, what's some things that we could do to help with that. Uh, the Uganda team will be in the chapel, maybe five minutes after the end of the service. Um, they'll be in there. Um, each of them is going to tell, them, tell you one highlight from their trip. Um, but um, please make the most of that opportuni opportunity. Um, encourage you to talk to them. Um, when you hear the great things that God is doing, um, there's nothing better, I think, to be motivated and inspired to do something in your own life. Thank you.